You're listening to the Mind Your Business Podcast, episode number 88. Today, we're going to show you the first steps to working less and making more. So you better stay tuned. Hi, I'm James Wedmore, and I've built a seven-figure internet business that offers the financial freedom to do what I want, when I want. And I'm the first to say that hard work and hustle are not essential ingredients for your success. So how do you build a thriving business from the inside out? This is the Mind Your Business podcast featuring myself and co-host Phoebe Morocek. All right. Hello, listeners. James Wedmore here. And I'm Phoebe Morocek. And this, this, this is the Mind Your Business podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in Today, we've got a very special episode here for you. This ever-elusive pie-in-the-sky promise, is it really possible to work less and make more? Maybe, perhaps, you're going to find out here today on this episode as we break it down for ya, for y'all. But first, Phoebe, how you doing? I'm great. It has been a while since we've recorded, so we have so much... To catch up on. Yes. So we, many we things do. that we've both been up to, and I'm excited to hear all about the cool things that you're up to. You go first. Okay. So I have had so much going on in the last couple weeks. I am, for those of you who knew, I had a mastermind. So now I have a nine month mastermind, and everyone is absolutely killing it. I'm having the best time, just feeling really in flow with my work stuff. Outside of work stuff, I've just been really enjoying San Francisco. I've been traveling a bunch up the coast, which has been really nice. I actually have my first keynote speech on Ooh. Friday, which I am thrilled about. I'm a little bit nervous, but I've been working with a speech coach and I am like ready and raring to go. Wow. And that's a big wait, that's a big deal. So can you tell us more about the speech and everything? Well, like what are you talking about and who are you talking to? So it's actually in San Mateo, so it's not too far from San Francisco. And I was approached by this gentleman named David Dodson, and the event is called The Happiest Entrepreneur, and it's talking all about how to find happiness as an entrepreneur, which obviously is like what I do in my life. So I was really excited when I was approached, and he and I have just been chatting a lot about you know what I bring and what my message is. And so... My speech is all around how to build a business and life around three words. And those three words are truth, trust, and transparency. I'm getting very personal, sharing yeah. a lot of things that I've never shared before. And working with the speech coach yesterday, I actually like had a lump in my throat and I was getting <laughs> really nervous to share. But I have to say I was inspired by our podcast, The I think it's episode 71, The Power of Your Story, that was the one I had the most people reach out to me after that episode because I really felt like I shared a piece of me mm. that I don't ever share. And so this one is kind of episode 71 on steroids. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Story's so huge, isn't it? It is. Sorry to interrupt, but we saw this movie Life last night with Ryan Reynolds and Jake Gyllenhaal. And it's like, it's a good movie. But it could have been so much better. And basically, I don't want to spoil it for anybody. But like, it's kind of like a horror film. It's like an aliens, you know, it's like a horror film in space. And a lot of the people die on the ship. Not to spoil the movie for you. And we left the theater last night going like, man, that was okay. Like cool special effects and cool music. And it was really scary. But like, I didn't really care that those people died. Mm-hmm. And then we we're like, yeah, you know why? Because they didn't tell their backstory. So you just didn't mm-hmm. care. So like, I think that's a, what was that? Episode 71? Yeah. It's such a powerful episode because like, I think it was about Phoebe and I like, we'll take the first step. We'll share ours if you share yours, right? (laughs) Like, okay, we'll be a little vulnerable and share our story, but it should be an invitation for you to share yours. Like if Phoebe's talking about how the impact it's had and the connection and the context that it's created with listeners, that just is a testament to the power of your story. You know, part of what makes a great story is... The contrast. In fact, I believe there is a direct, here we are going on a tangent, by the way, a direct correlation with the effectiveness and the engagement of a story and the amount of contrast that there is. Yes. Right? Like the lowest of the low and then the highest of the high. And like, that's just an opportunity for us to really like honor and appreciate the lows. You know, some people here might be in a low right now. We go, well, that's just the juicy part of your story. (laughs) 
Well, and one of the things that I was talking to this speech coach about, you know, she was like, what's your central message and all this and we were going and just kind of riffing and I was listing all these things that I, you know, my truths and what I really believe. And one of them was like, your past doesn't dictate your future. And then I actually, I was like, actually, I'm going to change that and say the opposite. And I feel like your past doesn't restrict your future, but it builds who you are right. and it guides you into the future. And she was like, that's an interesting reframe. And I'm like, but that's what I'm talking about is like all these puzzle pieces that I was once so ashamed of. And now I've kind of come back to like actually own it and be like, yeah, that happened. Mm. And look at me now. Like I'm a pretty happy entrepreneur, I think. So, <laughs> look at me now. That's really <laughs> exactly. great. And because like, I don't know, I, I think entrepreneurs are a special bizarre breed. When it comes to things like happiness, I, I can only speak on my own from my own experience, but I don't think I could have happiness if I wasn't an entrepreneur. And I know that's very conditional happiness, but I remember a time being an employee and like there was pros, there's benefits. Like I could get home from work and completely shut off and just like play video games and not have a care in the world. But that did not last very long. Like I definitely felt like something was drastically missing in my life. And there's something about entrepreneurship where number one, you're taking on like full responsibility in your life, especially if you do it right. Like you take on massive responsibility for, you know, you have a say for how your life goes now in all areas. But also you realize very quickly that you... How, how do I say this? But I mean, this is why we're here on this podcast that like the more you grow, the more you learn, the better you become, the more you evolve, the more that the business almost becomes the like manifestation or the result of who you are and how you show up. Yeah. Right. Like it's like, boom, instant gratification or maybe like, you know, a few month gratification later. But like I see the result of the work I do in this thing we call business. And like, I don't know, that makes me happy. So, yeah. I, I mean, I think a business is a, who knows? Like, I think even just the topic of happiness is always such a big topic. I think something could make someone happy one day and miserable the next. <laughs> like a business can do that too. That's like the evolution, right? And like what we're talking about is, you know, knowing knowing yourself and learning yourself. And one of the things that I'm, I don't have a lot of slides because I really just want to kind of talk very freely and openly. And I know kind of generally what I want to say, but one of them is I really believe that your business is an extension of you, which is what you just said. And yeah. I think that the more you grow, I think I've realized like the more I grow kind of, I realize the less I know and the less I know, the more I want to grow mm -hmm. and to grow my business. It's the exact same way. And so kind of my big message is like, you got to go inwards before you can, you know, in my experience, I've collected a lot of experiences and really cool things and I've gotten the t-shirt and I've ticked the boxes, but you know, that doesn't last yeah. and that doesn't help me create an amazing business. Whereas now that I've kind of done a lot of work in the last couple of months have been, I mean, absolutely life changing for me. And that's all started because I kind of, you know, I had the balls to like go inwards and really like heal all the things that needed to be healed. So that's been a very interesting journey for me and I'm excited to talk on Friday about it. So that's awesome. Well done. Yeah. I feel the same way. Like I struggle with this, but then like kind of embrace it. It's so true. I feel so much more like the moment you think you have an answer, you simultaneously have these experiences of like, I know nothing. <laughs> yes. And like, I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you, you look back and it's like, well, we've recorded like 90 episodes. I got to know something, but it's like, but then you stand in this moment of like, I really don't know anything. And then I kind of like tell myself like, you know, you should embrace that. Like there is power in, I heard this a long time ago and I just, I loved it so much. It's like, there's so much more power in the question than in the answer. Cause mm -hmm. the moment you have the answer or the moment you think you have the answer you have a limit, you have a limitation, you have a finite boundary around what is and what isn't. You cut off all other answers. And so I think there really is a beauty in the not knowing, in not, you know, sticking to this, like, this is the answer, this is the way, this is the path, which I think so many people are seeking and looking for. And what's so wrong with this blank 
space of infinite answers and possibilities and not knowing. I don't know. I have waves of that all the time. My existential crises that happen on a daily basis. Good times. <laughs> Good times. So that's exciting. Well done. Well Thank done. Thank you. And another one last exciting thing. Well, two last exciting things. I am having a hosting a two-day mastermind in London this summer, which I'm so excited. I have like a whole itinerary for like a big UK trip, which I'm excited about. And then I also did my level one pranic energy healing certificate. Wow. So I went full into the woo. It was yeah. amazing. <laughs> Dipped your toe so, and then dove right into the deep end. I mean, there was no toe dipping there. It was <laughs> it was a full on experience. Wow. <laughs> but really fun. And, you know, when we talk about just this knowing of, you know, this is what I'm in exactly the right place. And I felt like I was it had all kind of come to this moment. And I was like, you know what, this is, I've wanted to do this for a really long time. And I just never found a good way. And actually I found it through, I was having sciatic problems and was trying to, I was like Googling one night at three o'clock in the morning. Cause I couldn't sleep and was like, how is there like a meditation? What can I do? I know we've talked about on the podcast before and I found this energy healing actual like YouTube video. And I ended up Googling it in San Francisco and that was on Wednesday. And they were like, huh, there's one this weekend right down the street. And I was like, that well, is awesome. that's all lining up perfectly. Yeah. So that is what I have been up to. James, I know you have lots of stuff. I followed you on Instagram and we're like, oh I don't gosh. even know where to start. So why don't you tell us? Well, I'll give the super, super brief version, which is that the month of March was spent a hundred percent all in on crafting a new video series that we're doing for business by design. And all I can say is it was something that tested me almost daily, mentally, emotionally, and physically, but it was such a extraordinary experience because it is, it takes me back to my roots where it's combining my passions and my creativity and going all in on something like giving it my all, like answering, what would it look like to give a hundred percent of you and then some to a project? We flew out my old time, good buddy, Ryan Say, or my videographer from back in the day from the UK. We got him a place down here in Laguna for a month and the entire team like pretty much dropped everything and just focused on this. And it was super intense, but super amazing. Like just all the stuff we did, but it was, I mean, we just wrapped up yesterday. So it's like, it's really nice too to like put a, you know, check mark off something that you've just worked your tail off on and gave it your all and just feel like really proud. And, and literally just before we started recording, we just said goodbye to Ryan. He's off back to the UK where he lives. So yeah, that was my big update for the month of March. So anyways, now you guys are all caught up to speed, aren't you? Let's get into today's episode, which I think is something I would hope that most of you are interested in. I know there are a lot of people out there touting that, you know, hey, just work harder, hustle more. And we always like to challenge that for a lot of reasons. You know, you can work really hard digging ditches. And, you know, I don't know how far that's going to get you. I know a lot of people that have worked really hard. Recently, we did an episode, episode 84, on the topic of burnout. And you would be surprised, but a lot of people resonated with having an experience of burnout at least once on their own. Mm -hmm. I believe there is something plaguing this industry right now. The symptom, one of the symptoms, you know, besides like burnout, is overwhelm. We've talked about overwhelm in the past. We'll talk about it briefly here. But most people, we did a huge survey about a month ago. Number one thing people described, completely overwhelmed. So overwhelm is this interpretation we have when we have an experience of a lot on the to-do list or you know a lot of items or more items than we have time allotted. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what's going on here. And the ironic part, especially as an entrepreneur, is that the time allotted 
is something that we've given to ourselves. They're self-imposed deadlines. So most of the time, we're causing our own overwhelm, if not every time, because yeah. we're choosing, it's got to be in by Friday, you know, or, or I only have today to do this, you know, and that's us deciding that. And chances are like, we can really, does it have to be Friday? You know, could it be next Friday? So it's the amount of items and the time. Too much to do, not enough time. And so that's like the symptom. And we definitely, you know, have to point out if you've been overwhelmed before, I don't think you've really, you're really in business if you haven't had an experience or that wave of over. When was the last time you felt overwhelmed, Phoebe? Uh, I mean, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's just about a daily occurrence for me. If we're going to be like, you know, real about this. I think the only difference is, is knowing when you're overwhelmed and knowing the path out of it. Mm -hmm. That's a huge first piece. Oh yeah. I mean, we've, I've been overwhelmed almost on a daily basis, especially during this whole video shoot that we've been doing. It's just like, oh my gosh, like there's only so much time in the day and we'll give you the way out as well. But that's like the symptom I believe the source of the problem is really twofold. Number one, gosh, and there's this great quote that says, oh, and I'm totally going to botch it, but I saw it on Instagram somewhere. It was like, you know, stop running a business because you want to run a business and start solving problems. Mm. And I really do feel that a lot of people get into business because they like the idea of business and they think they're running a business, but they're not plain business owner. Their way of being is not as a business owner, but rather the employee in the business. And I don't blame anybody for that. That's, there's no reason to shame someone for that. The fact of the matter is, and I've vented about this in the past, but at least I can only speak for the U.S. public education system and society in general here and the culture here, but we are groomed to be employees. Mm -hmm. We are told you know, how to act and behave as an employee. Girl, I mean, just think about it. You know, going back to school, it's all about how to follow directions, how to stand in line, how to, you know, do what you're told when you're asked and, you know, raise your hand and all these things. That is not an entrepreneur. We didn't just describe an entrepreneur. We described a student or an employee. And so then what we do is we take that because it's the only way we know this is why, hello guys, like this is why you see all these inspiring stories of dropouts that start successful companies because they chose not to mold themselves to the student slash employee role. And I'm going to say it's the same thing. And again, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being an employee. There's nothing wrong with having a great career. What it is, is, is like, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a right foot or a right shoe, but you put the right shoe on the left foot, you got a problem. You act like an employee when you own a business, you got a problem. That's it, right? So you have these extraordinary people that went on to become extraordinary entrepreneurs and build extraordinary businesses. They chose not to fit into the mold of the employee. So what people do, because they know in no other way, is they get into business and they go, okay, well, I want to make more money or I want to grow. And the response is usually, so I'll work harder and I'll work longer. And again, there's that hustle and do more. And then they think because they've worked so hard that they deserve it. Now, I believe everyone's deserving of every desire they have, but what we end up doing, which is the second part of this, is just working on the wrong things and spending a lot of our effort, a lot of that hustle on the wrong things. And I believe partly that has to do with fear or, you know, limiting beliefs, which is ultimately, I clump those together. Fear of doing what you really need to do. And instead you avoid it in what we call here, the hustle denial. And we actually find a lot of, can find a lot of certainty and comfort in the safety of hard work. There is something comforting in that. And you might argue and push back on that, but if you're really honest with yourself, for most people, there is something comforting about that. Especially when every day as an entrepreneur, it's like a blank canvas every day. And you're like, 
how do I fill it? And if you don't know, you just fill it with doing an action that will at least give you an experience for that day you were productive. Does that resonate with you? It does. And I think the, so in my experience, I never had a laid out path for, I mean, who does just the examples of having entrepreneurial, you know, parents or anything like that. I mean, I very much come from an entrepreneurial background. However, it was a very, you know, it was like in manufacturing, it was all in these like, well, this is what you do. And it was kind of this outdated, like, well, first you have this business plan and then you do this. And for what we do, it's not laid out like that. So for me in the last couple months, it's been finding this comfort in the uncomfortable and allowing myself to have that knowing that trusting that that's okay. If nobody's done this before, I'm allowed to do that if that feels right for me. And I have never had that like example moving forward, you know, in my life and my family, that's like, okay, if you don't know the answer, that's okay. My, you know, kind of how we're brought up in the education system is like, if you don't know the answer, you go and you find it. And then you go and you apply it back to your business in a very kind of cookie cutter standardized way. And with entrepreneurship, the beauty of entrepreneurship is so much outside of that. And it's allowing yourself to really stand in your own power and your own truth and do what you feel is right. As opposed to, you know, the word hustle, I hear it all the time. And it's like just this busy work. And when you ask people how they are, and I've been making mental notes recently in conversations when you're like, oh, how are you doing? And they're like, busy, like interesting, because that is not a word in my vocabulary at the moment. And that is a word I am so (laughs) choosing not to use because that's not where I find comfort. And I want to find comfort, as I said, in the uncomfortable. So having that fear of, what we need to do. It's like, or the fear of like not knowing what we need to do, but the confidence and the comfort and the being, you know, okay with not knowing and finding your own solution or driving, you know, kind of blazing your own trail as well. So it sounds totally counterintuitive. And again, if we can make the assumption that most of our listeners had a traditional public school education or even a private, I mean, I had a private school education and still taught to be an employee. This all sounds counterintuitive. Hustle and busyness, one and the same. And there is actually, those are the things that we are actually complaining about. Yet what we're saying is that there's comfort in those, that there is a sense of certainty, like it's something to cling on to, right? <laughs> if you were just free to do anything, I mean, that it's almost like too much freedom it can Mm -hmm. scare the crap out of you whereas what we'll get into more you know what i always label as the five percent and i love doing that label because i think we all intuitively know what those things are you may not have the plan you may not know the plan yet but if i asked you you know like if we knew your goals if you're clear on your goals and your vision and the direction the vector in which you were headed I could start to say, well, what are the 5% of activities that are going to yield 95% of the results? Most of the time, people can intuitively answer that question or get pretty close to the mark. But chances are, it's those 5% activities that are the scariest. So, but also can be the lightest and easiest. For example, Mm -hmm. Phoebe speaking on stage at her first event could be scary could be intimidating. You know, people say they fear public speaking more than they fear death. But it could be once she's up there, it's always the fear before. Once she's up there, she could say that was the most exhilarating, powerful, life-changing, transformational moment in my life. And the people in the audience were then impacted. And she could have customers, clients, deals, opportunities come raining in from that one opportunity. That is a perfect, perfect example of a 5% activity that is scary as hell, outside our comfort zones, inviting us, begging us, calling us to play a bigger game. But we, well, there's all these, I got to get my website up and my business card and all these other things that, you know, you can always sit in the safety of the busyness and the hustle. And that, I mean, gosh, like if we don't, we should sound like a broken record at this point because I feel like we say this on almost every episode, but you just have to keep pointing it out to people. That I think that's the difference. And what I've always called these is at-bat moments. The reason it's scary 
and I'm not assuming that it is for Phoebe, but for someone else, like still when I speak today, like I get a little butterflies in my belly. But the reason it's scary is because there's an opportunity for you to strike out at that moment, right? You're either going to hit a home run or you're going to get rejected. And the funny thing is, is when we put ourselves on the line like that, it's the fear of rejection that would prevent us from doing that. What if we could flip it and actually seek out as many of those opportunities for rejection as possible? Because on the other side of rejection is the results and the things that we're after. It's with the chance of rejection or failure or letdown that makes it so exhilarating in the first place, which is called living life. Well, I think one of the things that I always say, I'm like, you can tell a lot about a person when their back's against the wall. And it's one of these like moments where, you know, five minutes leading up to this speech, I have no other option but to do it. And I will find out very quickly (laughs) if this is something that I love to do or hate to do. But in that moment, when I was talking to the speech coach, she's like, so now how do you, you know, after I did, I presented it to her. I'm like, and she goes, how are you feeling? I was like, I am just so excited. And she's like, that's, great. You know, that's not what, you know, normally people say. And I was like, because how often do we get to do something for the first time? Mm -hmm. And for me, this is something that is, you know, very scary. There's a lot on the line here. And that's not even when it, then we get into like the business side of it. I'm still in the, like, I'm sharing a side of myself that nobody knows. And that to me is really scary. I could totally strike out and people could think I'm crazy, but I'm okay with that because I know that I'm standing in my truth and now all I have to do is just be and say what's on my mind. And so in those moments, it's like you really find out who you are and what you're made of. And those are the moments that I'm, those are the experiences right now, especially that I'm really seeking out and trying to pursue on a regular basis. So if you look what we're doing here, you know, this episode is about beginning to work less and make more. And What we're inviting you to do based on identifying the source of this huge symptom we see like overwhelm is to seek out those 5% activities that can appear scary, intimidating, and outside your comfort zone. And the argument that we are making that we invite you to try on is that stepping up to the plate more often, putting yourself on the line more often Putting yourself in a situation where it's either strike out or home run can only guarantee more opportunities for having home run or for being successful. And what I want to do now is create a distinction for you on two roles that we see all the time that I think separates the, well, like the rookies from the pros, really. And that is the role of the intern and the architect. And so the intern is a business owner that is not plain business owner. You know, you've heard the concept before working in your business versus working on your business. Well, the intern is definitely working in their business. And what's the first thing you think of when you think of an intern, you know, They don't get paid (laughs) and they've got to do all the work, right? (laughs) Intern sucks. So it's nice when you're in college and you can say, oh, I'm, you know, interning at this prestigious firm, but you don't really want to run a business where you're the intern. They're wearing all the hats all the time. They're doing all the jobs from customer support to graphic design, to copy, to lead gen, traffic, you name it. And I think... This is all too common when, you know, we have people coming, stepping into the business role for the first time ever from the employee mindset and being at that shoestring budget side. And we really want to encourage you to begin to, it might be a more than one step, but step into or move towards the architect role. And I know as I share the distinction for the architect, the objections will immediately come up. And so I'll just start with the objections. The biggest objections usually come down to 
money. I'm doing it all myself because I can't afford a team. I can't afford to hire anybody. I have to do it all myself. And I want to say I hear that, but we want to encourage that it's still possible no matter at what financial budget or level that you're currently at. In fact, I think back to when I started my business and I knew really darn fast that I couldn't be doing it all myself. I believe that you can't do it all yourself. I think you'd be crazy to do it all yourself. And I started in my parents' basement with Clint, who's that his whole tech team is still with us today. I was paying him $2 an hour, actually it was $70 a week, which is less than $2 an hour, if you believe it or not. And he's in the Philippines. And he was just, just to take a few hours off of my plate of work and just begin to give me my day back. But the architect is the true business owner that is building a well-oiled machine and he works on the business, not in it. He or she is not, you know, just working on all the hats or wearing all the hats and doing all the jobs. This doesn't necessarily happen overnight, but what we want to take you through through the remainder of this episode is the steps and evolution out of intern and into architect. And it can start at no matter what level you're at. And it really is by, it starts with putting on the lens, the architect lens through which you see your business, which is to get you the heck out of there as soon as possible. And we're going to do that in a moment with just some three steps that we're going to take you through. What I want to do though, is I want to throw out, we've got a really cool quiz and resource. I'm going to give you in a moment before I do that. I want to give you two books that I think will really help you with this as well and expand upon this. E-Myth Revisited, classic. I like, you've, have you read that book? I have. Yeah. I, it's actually sitting right by my bed. Yeah. Yep. I say that's the best business book ever written on how to run a business. And it really aligns with a lot of you know, what we're talking about here. If you haven't read that, it needs to be the next book that you read in the business or marketing category guaranteed. The next book you want to read after that is called Rocket Fuel by Gino Wickman. First of all, love this book. Now, you have not read this. Is that correct? That's correct. I haven't. Okay. Super simple read. You can read the first two or three chapters and just get the concept in 20 to 30 minutes. But what this book does is creates a distinction between two roles, which kind of mirrors a little bit the architect, which is the visionary and the integrator. And the simple definition here is that the visionary is literally that, the person who has the vision, who's pushing the company forward, who's looking a year down the line, five years, 10 years, et cetera, dreaming big and thinking big and pushing the boundaries. Every great business needs this person. And we can think of many iconic, you know, visionaries that have created extraordinary companies. But if you look closely, the unsung hero of these companies is the integrator. And that's really the second in the command, the woman behind the woman or the man behind the man, the integrator. And this is the person that really makes it happen and makes the business work. And I always use this analogy of a car where you can have a great looking car, beautiful body, beautiful paint job. You just look at it and you're like, wow. And you know, there are a lot of people in our industry that you look at their business like that and that's your first expression. Wow, they're so good. That looks amazing. I'm so impressed. And then you pop open the hood. Ugh. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) Yeah. Now, the visionary in this simplistic analogy or metaphor, the visionary is that how the car looks. I'm not just talking brand, but you know, it's the whole picture, the what the company stands for, where it's going, its goals, you know, all that stuff. But does it work? And these two roles are very important. So, you know, kind of going off on a side tangent here, but these are great books. This is Rocket Fuel. And then the other one we mentioned was Emeth Revisited. Okay, so what we want to do really briefly is take you through three simple steps to take the first steps in moving from the intern role into the architect role. That should be the goal. Despite any objections you have, despite any limiting beliefs, despite that voice in your head that's saying, yeah, James, look, easy for you. You've been doing this for 10 years. 
Look, I've heard it all. I, <laughs> this isn't the first time I've been teaching this stuff or talking about it. I get it. I get it. But you don't need to wait 10 years to figure this out. In fact, it's going to take longer the more you put this off. So step one is to identify where you're at, is to identify your current role. And what we've done is put together a really cool, simple 10-question quiz that's going to help you to see where you're at, but it's going to also ask you some really great thought-provoking questions, things that really help you to put the architect lens or the architect glasses on for a moment. I want to invite you to take that quiz at the end of this episode. jameswedmore.com forward slash quiz. It takes just two minutes, more or less, to answer those questions. And then you're going to get a little bit of a diagnosis on which role you are. Okay, it's that simple. Now, for most people, if you're still listening on this episode, it's because you resonate with being more in the intern role than the architect. So we'll just assume for right now that you are. If you are, we want to take you to step two, which is a a two-part process. We want to identify, or we want you to identify, the low-value activities and the high-value activities in your business. And this can take some time. There's several different ways to do this. But what is very important is for you to be able to label, to identify, to make the distinctions of what is of high impact and high value and what is not. So I think we'll give some examples of low value activities. Phoebe, do you have some? Absolutely. I mean, for me, Facebook ads are a low value to actually set them up is a low value activity. For me, high value would be to actually create, you know, the content behind the Facebook ad, you know, whatever. And that could be dictating it to somebody else who's actually creating it for me. But having that funnel in process or in place is a really strong activity on a number of different levels. Yeah. So that's an interesting one because you could sit there and say doing Facebook ads. And I would say, well, you know, if you're doing anything online One of the top things that you should make sure is included in that strategy is where's your Facebook ad strategy. But as you dive into Facebook ads, you realize really fast that to do it right, there's a lot of repetitive, reoccurring, daily minutia. You know, I feel like it's like gardening. You're like planting (laughs) seeds. Some of them grow. Then there's some weeds. You got to cut out the weeds and you got to plant some more and then water those and day in and day out maintaining. And so... I'm looking at our launches and how we use Facebook ads. There's a probably a two or three hour meeting that I run with our Facebook ads guy where I am working with him to plan Mm -hmm. our Facebook ads strategy, which includes, okay, what are our creatives? What's the concept? How are we doing this? Where are we sending people? Who are we targeting, et cetera. And then of course we're setting performance goals and like, here's the numbers we want you to hit. Here's what we're after, et cetera. Uh, But then he's doing it. (laughs) Now that's, you know, that's something that like, you know, I can't afford someone yet. Well, great. You should still be doing Facebook ads. So you Mm -hmm. find a way to do it until you can hire someone. So that's something that you can like break up. Like, I don't know if I want to be out of that conversation when it comes into a launch just yet. I mean, I could, I totally could, But yeah, I like to keep a finger on that pulse. Okay, what's another low-value activity for you? Uh, Scheduling. That is a a big one. I hate scheduling. (laughs) I hate the calendar. I hate it. Like, just mentally, it exhausts me. So that was very early on of something that I needed to make sure I was not touching, that I was completely removed from. And, like, Mm -hmm. think about that. Like, well, wait a second. Like, if you really want to build your business, your way. Why would I keep doing that? It's like, sometimes we just kind of say, Oh, I'll just increase my threshold of pain and sack it up. And like, what? No, you don't have to do that. And that stuff's really easy. By the way, total side note, kind of fun resource. We just found it's called magic assistant. Have you heard of this before? No, I haven't. It's literally a phone number that you can text. And within two minutes, they will reply 24 hours a day seven days a week, virtual assistant on demand. 
It's an actual person? It's an actual person. Was- oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In the U.S. And they're highly trained assistants. And, like, it's kind of expensive. It's $35 an hour. But it's really great if you're like, oh, I only have, like, these two or three random assignments every week that I need. You know, like, well, great. You don't need to go out and hire somebody. Like, here's someone on demand whenever you need it. And I've used it for, like, little things. Like, I took a bunch of people out to dinner a couple weeks ago. And I was like, hey, find a restaurant. And we were in San Diego. I was like, find a restaurant for 12 people, San Diego, this time. Here's kind of a type of restaurant we're looking for. She handled the whole thing. Even gave us, like, walking versus driving directions. Gave me reminders. Like, it was just like, this is amazing. So, a lot of times we think we have to do all these things. We don't. We really don't. Low activity. Now, this is important. Low value activity. These are important distinctions I'm making within this. Customer support. Now, those are high value activities because it's important that you have great customer support. It's important that, uh, you know, quick response time, that, you know, friendly and all that good stuff. But that doesn't have to be done by you. In fact, if you're in a personal brand business, online business, you know, that has a customer support department, this is the first thing that needs to go. This is one of the absolute first things that will take away your time. And that's a scary question to ask is like, if you're spending three to four hours a day in your customer support, what is that keeping you from doing? That's a scary question if you really, I dare you to answer it, you know? That's one that's like, it's important, but it's so easy to have someone else do it for you. If you're spending three hours in customer support, what's going on in your business that requires all this attention? You know, even if it's like a forgotten password or something, but if it's actual like, you know, real issues, then maybe it's time to take a step back and look at, you know, your actual business. Well, sure. (laughs) And I I mean, I think our support is more than three hours a day, but that's because, you know, ton of customers, you know, ton of stuff. But actually... That brings up something which maybe we do a whole nother episode on this. We, in January, did a internal workshop, customer support workshop, where what we did, because there's just so many things that we're like, well, let's not address them one at a time. Let's take two days of our lives and let's focus on these. And what we did is we looked at like the top 15 customer support inquiries and we found solutions to those. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to think of one because it was in January. So it was, it was a while back. But like, if I can recall, and this is a great example of this. One of them was people weren't getting their username and password. And we said, great. So let's find the source of why that's happening. And one of the reasons was, and this is silly, <laughs> people were misspelling their own email. If this happens more than you can imagine. So we're sending their username and password to an email that doesn't exist. And then they get, you know, they get upset and then, you know, people cancel or refund because they had the first bad experience. So there's actually steps you can do to prevent that. Like one of which is like make them submit their email twice on the order form. And then the other thing that we did is we created a better thank you page, order confirmation page that lets them know the next steps of expectation. Hey, your email with your username and password should be in your inbox within the next 90 seconds. If it's not, it could have been this problem, this problem, or that problem. Email our support immediately so we can solve this. You know what I mean? There's always a solution to improving processes and resolving problems but it's a high value activity for me to come in and solve these problems it's not a high value activity for me to be doing those things you know running support and stuff like that so i just said ah here's a solution could you guys do this totally yeah good Mm -hmm. okay now if you're a personal brand business there are some high activities that we need to look at which for me is doing this podcast right? You know, a personal brand, like you want to be out there, you want to be seen or heard or both. And so me doing webinar, me, you know, doing my video series was something that, you know, is a very high value activity for me. So I had to be on camera, but I think there's a line that's different for everyone, right? That, you know, where is the line? Where do you go from do this? Don't do that. I should be doing this or I shouldn't be. And first of all, it's up to you. And it's also something that the line moves as you grow. 
And so the perfect example I look at is companies like Digital Marketer, who there are things that they're not doing that I do. Like they have people on their team that do a podcast, but the owners and creators of Digital Marketer are not actually on the podcast, or at least the episodes that I've listened to. They might be on some of them. I don't know. But I also know, because we were at their event traffic and conversions a few weeks ago, they have a blog. They have content in a members area. They're not creating the content. And so when we start going down this path, it can start to blow your mind a little bit that you can build an online brand around your content and not be doing all the content yourself. Like that, that can be the line for you, that, that, that anything is possible, but how, how do you do that? And that really takes us to step three, which is to begin using the word I like to use, processizing these activities. You have to find a way to turn even the most, what you think is unique and create creative things into a step-by-step procedure or process that can be done by anybody else. And you want to start with the lowest value activities. And there's a great, I don't know if we've talked, I think we've talked about this on another episode, the distinctions between, you know, the $10 an hour tasks versus Mm -hmm. the hundred, right? And there are these tasks that you could be doing that someone else could be doing for 10 to $20 an hour. That's where you start. Customer support, probably something like graphic design and, you know, scheduling, (laughs) you know, personal assistant type stuff. How can we let go of those? And ironically, ladies and gentlemen, what becomes a high value task is creating those processes. That actually is a high value task. And I know, Phoebe, you have a really cool way in which you've created processes in the past. Yes. Yeah. So what I would do was I would record my... So anytime I knew that there was something that would have to be replicated at some point, I would... For example, a big thing of mine was writing emails, <laughs> writing and sending emails through Infusionsoft because it just... It was just really frustrating. <laughs> and I feel like I could never format it in like 10 minutes. It would just like go all over the place. So what I would do is I would sit down and I would take a screen capture video. One that I use right now is called Viewed It. Do you, have you used that, James? I've never heard of it. Oh, it's so great. And you can like see when somebody's seen it and it's awesome. But anyway, they host it on their site. And so what I would do is I would sit down at Infusionsoft and actually like write the email, copy and paste it in there. And as I'm doing it, I'm walking somebody through the steps. So I'm saying, okay, and then you go here and you click on this button and this is what you do. So I'm actually doing my work because I'm sending the email, but I've created a video, which then I hand off to an assistant who then I've asked to create a process map, which we've used sweet process. So it's up to her then to take all of the information that I've given her to create this process map and then send it back to me for approval. But the way I approve it is then she sends me a test email. So it's, it kind of comes full circle. I think that last piece is so crucial that there's kind of this checks and balance piece into it. So I remember one of the first times we did this was creating what we called the ultimate webinar process map. We were doing a lot of webinars. And so from things like the registration page to go to webinar, to integrating it with your Infusionsoft account and the emails and all this stuff. And I was like, this is a full day thing. And if I do that, that's every time I want to do a webinar, which doing a webinar is a high value activity for me, but creating the webinar was draining my time and energy. I documented the whole thing and I could hand it over to someone who had zero experience, who had never done it before. And in a day later, boom, done. And that's when you're like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. (laughs) It's so nice. And I think when I was making, because there were a couple of times where I made my own process maps and when I would hand it off, there was just everything was slipping through the cracks. And I was like, why is that? And it's because we assume so many things about the person, you know, the assistant who's actually doing it. I'm like, well, of course she's going to know how to log in and how to get to this place where the email. And it's like, well, no, she doesn't know that. And so it is like bringing it all back to as simple, like a very simple framework. Micro steps. Like exactly. You do not skip a step. You do not. I mean, and that's the thing is you hear this and obviously Phoebe already offered a solution is like, you just record yourself doing it and have someone do it for you. And then you work with them until they nail it right. And then 
okay, now they're trained on how to process size your activities. But so many people aren't doing this. And when you don't do it, you're stuck doing it all yourself. And then the moment you get sick, tired, go on vacation, take time off or get too busy, the business stops. And that just can't happen. And so that's what we're really talking about here is getting you to put on the architect glasses, looking at your business through that lens and take those steps today in the right direction to move and step into the architect role where you get to create the business your way where you literally, and this is always the analogy that we use that allowed me to have these type of epiphanies. I think everyone has to go through their own, oh, epiphany in this whole journey. For us, it was like the Lego instruction manual. Like if you've ever built Legos, We love building Legos. It is step by step, brick by brick, piece by piece. And whoever creates those manuals, I mean, they're like 100 pages long for these Lego toys. Like, it sounds awful to create that. And it can be, but it's like, this is the last time I'm ever going to have to do this myself. And that's just amazing. So the secret to working less and making more, as much as that, title sounds like cheesy and hypey (laughs) is to step into that architect role and focus on working on your business by creating the instruction manual, the processes, the procedures, the systems to allow others to do it. Even if you can only afford a part-time virtual assistant, that's the point is that a lot of this stuff should be so simple that anybody can do it. This is the difference between having a systems-dependent business versus a people-dependent business. I think a lot of people are looking for that magic unicorn that can like read your mind and wear all the hats for you so you can just do what you love. And I just got to say, like, what does that say about your business if that's what you need? Because you know, unicorns don't exist and neither do these magical people. Well, maybe unicorns do exist. But, you know, jury's still out on the unicorn. But, you know, you just, you know, they don't exist. Like, you want that person that can do everything. They're out there. They're out there building their own business. Not Mm going to go work for you. (laughs) So you've got to find an easier way to create the structure and put the people in place, even if it's only virtual assistant. And it's possible. This is the first steps to letting go to working less. So to recap really quickly, step number one is to identify the current role that you're filling. We identify three roles and give a diagnosis or prognosis on each of them. You can take that quiz, this assessment quiz over at jameswedmer.com forward slash quiz. And then what we want to do is in step two, we want to start daily, just start documenting what you do. I know this isn't fun. I know it's not sexy, but this is the results are sexy. And if you do the work, it's so powerful. You want to identify the low value activities you identify the high value activities, the 5% of stuff that you knew, you know, those at bat moments, the moments where you put it all on the line, whether it's speaking at that event or connecting with that joint venture affiliate partner or doing that webinar or pitching your stuff or that strategic relationship. Those are the high value activities. You want to spend more of your time there. And step three, process size and let go of the low value stuff. So that is it, three simple steps, and that is our invitation for you. We encourage you to do that, is to just start acting more like the architect, like the business owner. Thank you guys so much for listening. Look, if you haven't left us a review yet on iTunes, we would love for you to do so. Head on over to jameswedmore.com forward slash iTunes, or you can just go ahead and find us in iTunes And go ahead and leave a review. Every review helps. And obviously, we read each and every one of them. And it makes us super duper happy. So thank you so much, you guys, for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode. Are you a coach, course creator, or online influencer looking for an easier way to expand your reach, help more people, and get paid while you do it? I've built a multiple seven-figure business around my content, courses, memberships, and mastermind. And I'm going to give you the exact processes that show you how I did it. So if you currently feel stuck, stagnant, overwhelmed, or coursed the F out, this is the training that's going to graduate you from student mode into action mode. To join the party absolutely free, simply visit www.jameswedmore.com forward slash go.